God is a God of grace and mercy and love and goodness and kindness to us. And all of us who have been saved realize we were saved by the grace of God. That means by His unmerited, that is, His undeserved love and favor toward us as a result of sending His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the cross to die for our sin. We realize we didn't deserve that. That is a gift of His grace. We're, we're quick to understand that. Sometimes we forget to realize that everything else that comes our way is also the result of God's grace and love and mercy toward us. You say, well, what about those difficult times, those times that we don't like? Well, sometimes those also are gifts of God's goodness and love and mercy and grace toward us. Now, we don't realize why He sends them. We don't particularly like it. We don't like the nature of it. We don't like the timing of it. We don't like anything about it. And then as time goes by, we look back and realize God was just loving us. He was preventing us from doing something that would have wrecked our lives. We were heading in a direction that God knew was not wise. And so even the difficult times, those times that we don't understand, are also oftentimes acts of His love and grace and mercy. Well, certainly one of the ways that He expresses His grace toward us is in the fact that not only has He saved us, but He sent the Holy Spirit to seal us as a child of God forever and to live on the inside of us and to live through us the life of Jesus Christ. And so one of the essentials of the Christian life is that you and I grow. The Scripture says that we are to desire the sincere milk of the Word, that we may grow thereby. And so He is, has enabled us to grow. He desires that we grow, and He's equipped us to grow. And part of what's involved in all of that are His spiritual gifts. That is, He has gifts and manifestations of those gifts, how they're expressed, and He also has different ministries for us. And the Scripture tells us that the whole body of Christ needs the whole span of all of those gifts. Now, there are three primary divisions of Scripture that talk about the gifts, and one of them is in 1 Corinthians 12 that people understand primarily. And then, of course, there is um, the ministry gifts that Paul mentions in Ephesians chapter 4. And then, of course, there is his chapter in Romans, Romans chapter 12, where he talks about the motivational gifts, and he names them there. Now, you say, well, what is a motivational gift? Well, a motivational gift is that gift which is the drive within us. That is, it is the underlying motivating reason that we do what we do. Now, there are a number of those gifts. He mentioned seven of them. The gift of prophecy, for example, we've dealt with that. And the drive in prophecy is simply this. That is, the desire of the prophet is righteous living. Then is the gift of service, and the drive in the service gift is what? Meet a need. And then there is the drive in the teaching gift, the gift of teaching. And what is that? And that is to get knowledge out, the truth and knowledge. And then comes what we'll talk about today, and that is the gift of exhortation. And of course, then there's the gift of giving, the gift of leadership or administration, and the gift of mercy. Each one of those has an underlying driving uh, facet to it. Now, what I mean by drive is this. All of us do what we do and respond to situations on the basis of that drive. That is, that we are wired a certain way that God has wired us in order to help meet a particular need or facet of the body of Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, for example, and we read this every week on purpose because he makes it very, very clear what this is all about. He says, as each one of us has received a special gift, one of these motivational gifts. You may be gifted to do many things, and we've talked about the difference between a talent and a gift. We're talking about these spiritual gifts given to you at salvation. He says, each one has received a special gift, employ it. Put it to work for what reason? Serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God, the various expressions of God's grace in our life from salvation, all the rest. And so he says the reason he gives us these spiritual gifts is that you and I are to serve one another in the body of Christ. And he says in the next verse, we're to do it. He says we're to do it how? We're to do it in the strength of Almighty God. So God has gifted you as a believer, and he intends for you to exercise that gift. It's the underlying motivation for what you do. So we come to the gift of exhortation. And uh, what are the characteristics? Well, 
one of the primary characteristics of the gift of exhortation is this, and that is that person is motivated, motivated to urge people to listen, full spiritual growth. What is it that drives the person with the gift of exhortation? Above everything else, they desire to see other people grow in their spiritual life so that whatever they're doing, whether they're serving this person or whether they are giving here, whatever it might be, the underlying motivation of all of that is their desire to see people grow spiritually. And of course, the Scripture tells us that. And in each one of these gifts, there's some biblical character that best describes them. In prophecy, it was Peter. In service, it was uh, Timothy. In teaching, uh, it was Luke. And now in, in uh, exhortation, who do you think would be the best example of exhortation in the Bible? Who would it be? Paul, absolutely. Because all the way through his epistles, you will hear him saying things. And uh, what he's really saying in essence, he is encouraging people to grow in their Christian life. And here's what he says, for example, just one verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. He says, we proclaim him, that is Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ that is mature. And so verse after verse, scripture after scripture, chapter after chapter, epistle after epistle, what is he doing? He is encouraging us to live a godly life and to walk in that life and to grow up in a Christian life and to be spiritually mature believers because that's the will of God for all of us. The Bible speaks of um, children. For example, he says, my little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. And so what is he saying? We are all saved, born again, the Bible says, and we're little children, so we must grow. Many people are satisfied, it seems, that uh, they just want to be sure that they're saved and they get into heaven, so they want to get inside the salvation door and have somebody have God lock the door in, and then they want to just sort of live casually. No, because it is the will of God that you and I grow up, and the gift of exhortation is committed to doing what? the person they're able to influence, the person they're able to speak to, they're always going to have this innermost drive. Whatever they're saying, whatever they're doing, whatever the relationship is to help that other person grow up spiritually and become the person God wants them to be and to be able to accomplish the things that God wants them to accomplish. And so when you think about that, you think about the fact that because they have that gift, they're able to visualize. Listen, a person with the gift of exhortation can visualize for somebody else. They can visualize so accurately about what their possibilities are, what their potential is, and how God can work in their life. And so that is what drives them above everything else. Now, it would be wonderful if every parent had that gift. If every parent was so committed uh, to living before their children and to admonishing them and to encourage them to live a godly life and to grow up as a Christian by the time, they're, not by the time they're 40, but by the time they're 13, 14, 15, 16, they're on their way to spiritual maturity. And yet oftentimes parents want to wait till they become teenagers or become 21 years of age or whatever it might be. Listen, spiritual growth begins the moment you are saved and the more help you have and the more instruction you have and the more good exhortation you have, what happens is you grow stronger more quickly. The second characteristic is simply this, and that is the ability to see root problems in people. That is, a person who has a gift of exhortation is able to quickly go to the root of the cause of the problem in that person's life. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes it's selfishness. Sometimes it's insecurity. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's control, whatever it might be. All of us have those root issues in our life that need to be dealt with. Now, as long as you're willing to deal with them, God will expose them and he'll take care of it if you're willing. If you keep denying that you have a root problem and you just want to talk about it, you don't want to deal with it, and you say, well, that's not true of me, then what happens is you don't, listen, you don't ever deal with the root cause of the problem until you want to face the fact that you have one. And so the exhorter, he especially or she wants to get to the root of the problem and they have a very discerning spirit to be able to discern what that is. Now, once a person is able to understand what is the root cause? Why do I act that way? What, what, what is it about me? Why in this situation do I respond that way? Why do I say these kind of things? Why is it that I'm rebellious of you? Why is it I'm, I'm willing to give God some but not much? That is some root cause. So what is that root cause? Sometimes, as we said, it can be pride. Sometimes it's fear. Sometimes it's control. Sometimes it's selfishness. Sometimes, you know, they're different things. And so if you're going to get over it, if you're going to grow in your Christian life, and remember this, you can only grow, listen, you can only grow 
if you're willing to hit one of those and then you say, I'm willing to deal with this, you know what happens? Then you grow and you, and you hit the next one. You grow and you hit the next one. The truth is all of our Christian life, we are moving and growing. But here's what happens. When God brings something to your life, some root issue in your life, and you, and you, somebody either points it out and you recognize it's there, and you say, yeah, I know that's true, I know that's true, and you're not willing to deal with it, that is as far as you grow. This is why we've got spiritual pygmies in the church, and that is they have what? They have heard the truth, heard the truth, heard the truth, heard the truth, that's as far as they're going to grow. And what you have, you have a lot of people in church who do not know the Word of God, who are not growing in their Christian life, and they just want to uh, go to church and listen to sermons, but they don't want to change. Imagine that, the awesome potential that every single believer has, and you don't want to change. And you don't want to change simply because you're not willing to deal with what God has brought to light in your life. Root causes. Every parent wants to get to the root cause of what causes their 13, 16, 17-year-old to be rebellious. Well, God wants to be able to bring forth the same thing in your life so that you can grow and be a responsible child of God. And the person with the gift of exhortation, they know how to get to the root. Now, if you want somebody to get to the root, you let one of those persons deal with you. And this doesn't mean it's going to be hard and difficult necessarily. Because the person who's walking in the Spirit, who has the gift of exhortation, knows how to approach a person. And they're not going to walk up and say, I've been thinking about you and praying for you. And I'm going to tell you, you have a root cause of bitterness. <laughs> they're not going to do that because, you know, that's the end of the session when you do that. That's not the way to do it. And we'll talk about... Uh, how uh, people are misunderstood and also how they act when they get in the flesh. That is, how does a person who is a, uh, an exhorter, when they get in the flesh, that's what they do. It wouldn't be a matter of discernment, it'd be judgment. And so that's not the way we, we operate. So a third thing is this, and that is that person wants to prescribe steps of action. Now watch this. By steps of action, I mean what they'll do is say, okay, here's the root issue in your life we want to deal with. Now the first thing you need to do, step one, then they'll say, then step two. Or they may say, here's step one. Now, when we talk about that for a while and we work on that, then we come back to step two. Somebody says, well, now, I don't believe in all those steps. Well, I'm here to tell you, the only way you got here this morning is step by step. You got out of the bed, step one. And so the truth is in our thinking, in our process of how we, how we process ideas, we go by steps. A person, for example, who comes to church, now watch this, come to church, no notes, no Bible, nothing. They just, it's just a habit of going to church. Now, I'm not referring to guests who didn't happen to bring their Bible in their notebook this morning. But if you go to church all the time and you sit and you just listen to sermons and walk out, I'm telling you something. You're not going to get far for the simple reason you have, you have this conglomeration of knowledge. But you know what? Step one, step two, what about the steps? You say, I go to church. They don't give me any steps. You need to change churches. I'm going to tell you why. Because if somebody, somebody can preach to you, preach to you, preach to you, preach to you what you ought to do, what you ought to do, what you ought to not do, what you ought not to do, and never tell you how to do what you ought to do and how to stop doing what you're doing, then what's it all about? Steps are very important. And sometimes I've given you 12 steps to one, in one message, or 14 or whatever it might be, or six or two or whatever, because that's the only way you grow. You grow by understanding what the process is. How do I deal with it? For example, if I said to you, or you came to me and you said, well now, you know I have a very bitter spirit. I know I have. How do I deal with this? If I just said, well, just forgive them. You say, oh, no, 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 no wait a minute. I, I, I've been trying to forgive them. But if I said, now, first of all, step number one. Step number two. Step number three. Or if you said to me, now, I want to learn how to study the Bible. Well, I said, just read it. Well, that's not going to answer the question. And so what I want you to see is this. There are precise steps in any situation, and the same thing is true in our spiritual life. And what happens here is simply this. The gift of exhortation is very precise in giving steps. That is, if you will take this step, if you will take that step, and they're willing to, to get involved in your life to some degree. Now, I'm not talking about necessarily some big counseling situation. It could be a friend you work with, a friend at school, or in your home, or you're talking to your children. You give them precise steps. And what happens is, that's how we grow. We grow a little bite at the time. If I said to a person who's just uh, been saved, now, well, how do I live a Christian life? Get filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Well, 
That's a pretty good size order, and naturally we want to be filled with the Spirit. There are some people who understand salvation, and the Holy Spirit is explained to them upon salvation. It doesn't take them very long. Most of us didn't get it that way. And so, step by step by step, the person of the gift of exhortation is very precise in giving those steps and very insistent. If you just want to talk about it, the person of the gift of uh, exhortation is not simply interested in hearing you say the th same thing over again. They want to see some growth. They want you to grow. And they're doing the wisest thing they can do is to help you by giving steps. And this is the reason oftentimes that I say, okay, step number one. Step number two, why? If you write it down, you have a little map, you have a little traveling uh, uh, note here, and you say, well, I'm, I'm moving this step, that step, this step. And so what happens is that's the way we grow. We grow by learning this truth and this truth and this principle and that principle and one principle upon the other. And after a while, God's doing something awesome in your life. That's what that person's committed to. Then, of course, uh, they like turning problems into real benefits in our life. That's the way they think, the person who has the gift of exhortation. So therefore, they may say to you, well, I know you're going through a bad time, but you know what? This is really good. What do you mean it's good? I'm hurting. I'm disorganized. My mind's fragmented. You tell me that's good. That's real good. Well, how can it be good? Because you see, the gift of exhortation knows that if God has allowed you to get into this situation and you're miserable, he or she knows that God's working in your life. And I said to sometime, a friend some time ago, telling me all about what was going on. I said, you know what? I'm so glad. What do you mean you're glad? I said, because I see exactly what God's doing in your life. And the person with the exhortation, they welcome that. And so if they tell you, for example, well, what you're going through is really good and you're just having a fit over the whole thing, you just want to walk away, they understand that God does what? He prunes, he sands, he sculptures, he gets at the chainsaw sometime, if necessary. He works on us, and oftentimes what is he doing? Getting our attention. What does he want to do? He wants to grow us up. And he knows that, listen, he knows, for example, let's say that uh, you have a, a beautiful apple tree. I mean, it's luscious with apples, and I mean, very fruitful. And you just say, well, it did fine last year. I'm leaving it like that this year. It did fine last year and the year before that, and you never prune it. You cease pruning, quality goes down. Well, mark it down in the Christian life. If he doesn't keep us pruned, you know what happens? Then you know what? The fruit of our life also degenerates. And so God is in the process of doing that so that the growth process in the Christian life deals with hardship, trial, pain, persecution, rejection, and all the rest. And the person who has the gift of exhortation knows, takes that and turns it into something good by helping the person realize that, listen, God still loves you. He still cares for you. He has a purpose for you. He wants to work in your life. Give him the privilege and give him the opportunity of doing so. So sometimes when you're complaining about something, you need to ask yourself the question, God, trying to get my attention? What area of my life do you want me to look at? What is it you're trying to say to me that I don't understand? And sometimes I'm going to blame it on somebody else. And you see, as long as you blame, as long as you blame these things or most anything on someone else, you'll never face it. They say, we know this about our children, but sometimes we don't want to practice the same truth. That is, as long as you blame what's happening on God or someone else, then you're not going to see the root problem. And you see, here's what happens to so many marriages. So many marriages break up because somebody is not willing to see they have a root problem they will not deal with. I don't want to talk about it. Don't tell me about it. Don't give me that. Uh, no time to discuss it. When people quit talking, before long it's going to be all over. So you have to be willing to face the root cause. Why do I do what I do? Why am I feeling these feelings? And why do I act the way I act towards you? And why do I respond to people? There's something going on. Must be willing to look at it. Must, listen, must be take the, take the necessary steps. And if you're willing to do that, God can take care of anything if we're willing. Then, of course, that person, uh, the exhorter, desires not to write you a letter or call you on the phone. The exhorter wants to see you face to face. They want to look into your eyes. They want to see your responses. They love, listen, they love not being critical, but they love to see how you respond when you say, do you think there could be some root cause for this? And they can tell, listen, an exhorter can tell in a split second, faster than that, 
They'll watch you react. They'll watch you react right here, right in your eyes because you cannot. Listen, if there's a slight a bit of hesitation or rebellion or objection to what they say, it's written all over your face. You cannot hide it. And if you respond in the right way and you say, that's right, it's very evident. So the person has the gift of, of exhortation, desires to talk face to face. They want to see how you're responding because, listen, they want to see growth. And so you come back to them and you, or they come to you and they talk to you again. And this time, your response is totally different. Then the person with the gift of exhortation is encouraged because they see some growth. They see this desire. They see this hunger. Maybe the first time you talked, uh, you just said, you know what, not interested. I want to talk to you, but don't, don't give me any steps today. Then the next time, or two or three times later, they're saying, you know, now, now what was that step one you tried to give me? They see it, they feel it, and the person of gift of exhortation is very encouraged. And so, the church needs lots of exhorters because the truth is all of us need some. I have a person who is my very, very dearest friend, and that is, um, he is 1,000% exhortation. 1,000%. He happens to be trained in that area, but it just happens to be, by the grace of God, uh, that that's his spiritual gift. And it's amazing how intuitive they can be. For example, he will ask me a question once in a while, and I'll say to him, why did you ask me that? You know exactly what I'm going to say. <laughs> and he just laughs because it's the truth. And you see, everybody needs an exhorter in their life. I don't care who you are. If you think you're above and beyond it all, then you've you, you got a mixed state coming. Everybody needs someone that you can talk to, you can listen to, you can share your heart with. And if that person happens to have the gift of exhortation, you have a jewel. You have a treasure because they're going to make themselves available. They love to see you grow. This person is such an encourager to me. And sometimes when I'm saying, here's what I've been praying about and just asking God to show me about this. Well, you know, also the exhorter, oftentimes when the two of you are close, God will lay upon that person's heart what you're praying about. And when you talk to them, you know what? They'll already know it. They'll already know it, especially if they're a praying person. God delights in using exhorters to encourage us because that's what an exhorter is ultimately. They're an encourager, not a condemner, not a judger, but a person who desires to encourage. Now, if you're living up tight and you've got this wall up and you've pulled the shade down, nobody's going to get to you. All you're doing is committing spiritual suicide because you know what? God's going to break this out one way or the other. He's going to come at us one way or the other in love to help us to understand that when we humble ourselves before truth and we humble ourselves before one another, God is going to honor that. And so everybody needs an exhorter. Now, what you're not to do after this service is to run out and tell one of your friends, well, I decided today that I'm an exhorter, so you better listen to me from now. No, no, <laughs> that won't work. Because you see, if you're walking in the spirit, number one, you're not going to do that. The exhorter takes great delight, great delight in watching a person grow and desires to see that face to face. Now, likewise, um, that person desires uh, to gain spiritual insights themselves through experiences in their life. And so if you were to say to the um, um, exhorter, well now, what about you? The exhorter knows that this is the way you learn spiritual principles. The exhorter knows that this is the way you grow by personal experience. And the truth is, you think about this. When you go to someone, or if you were going through some problem, some heartache, um, would you, for example, go to someone who could only tell you what they read in the book? No, you would not. You want to hear from somebody who's been there. Somebody who's hurt like you've hurt. Somebody who's been through something that's been trying and difficult and hardship in their lives. And you want to hear them be open and the exhorter will be open because they want to get involved in your life. Not to, not to pry for being uh, nosy, but they want to get involved in your life to help you grow. Remember, their whole motivation is to help you grow up, help you to grow. And the truth is every pastor really ought to, ought, ought to be an exhorter, not necessarily happen to have that special gift but remember this, the truth is all of us have a unique gift, but all of us also have some qualities and some characteristics that are true of the other gift. I certainly do want to be an exhorter, 
And there are many things about this that, that are part of the way I think. I want to see you grow up. That's what I'm doing week after week after week. I want to see you grow up. So I'm there thinking and asking God to show me how to deal with this and so that uh, I can show someone else how to deal with this. And so we're all growing, leap by uh, just a little leap here and a big leap here and a, just an inch or so here. It depends on what people are going through. What do you think in your home? You need to be exhorting for those things that uh, help each other grow up. And so God needs all of us to have some bit of that quality within our life. And when I think about how that works and think about the fact that the person who is an exhorter is willing to go through difficulty, hardship, and trial, what does it do? It equips us, and you know this. Listen, the more you've been through, the more God has done in your life, the more he's worked in your life. And you may have been through some very, very tough times. You know what part of that is? God's equipping process. Equipping you may not be your spiritual gift, but he's equipping you to help somebody else in the body of Christ or somebody who's unsaved. That's the way God, that's, he says, all of these gifts, he says, employ it for the good of the whole body. So think about tough times you've been through. Think about disappointments you've had. Think about times of discouragement. Think about times when you were rebellious toward God. Think about times when he has forgiven you and you just think, God, how could you ever forgive me? All of that has equipped you to do what? To pour your life into somebody else's life. And I think about people who live a very selfish and self-centered capsule life. That's what I think about it. They go to work in the morning and they come home and they do their thing and then they get up the next morning and they do the same thing five or six days a week and on the weekend they just all closed up whether it's watching TV or whatever. What about the rest of the world? What about people out there who need you? People who, who want to fellowship with you? People you need to fellowship? People you need to pray about? People you need to give yourself away to? Selfishness doesn't fit. Capsule living doesn't fit who we are as the children of God. And so the person with the gift of exhortation, giving themselves away, unselfish in every way. And you see, the person the gift of exhortation is very strong. When they give us steps, these are the steps. Now, if you follow these steps, here's what you can expect. But if you don't, here's what you can expect. Very important. And so the person the gift of exhortation is strong in that way for that reason. Then, of course, uh, they desire to bring harmony uh, between people and between groups. A person of exhortation, they're not divisive. And so the way they operate, remember, is spiritual growth. And they know that spiritual growth is best accomplished where there's harmony. Well, between you and the person you're talking to. Or bringing harmony in your family. Or bringing harmony between you and somebody you work with. And so that's very, very much a part of their thinking, and that is the whole idea of bringing harmony to different people. And then, of course, with the gift of uh, exhortation is the characteristic of what makes them the happiest. What makes the person who has the gift of exhortation the most joyous? When they see you taking those precise steps and watching God work in your life and watching Him change you and watching how God is bringing about a change of attitude, therefore a change of action. What's happening in your family? What's happening where you work? In other words, one of the great characteristics of the exhorter is what makes them happy is very simple, watching us grow up in our walk with God. Now, how are these exhorters misunderstood? And they are misunderstood. Well, let's think about it for a moment. First of all, the overemphasis, at least in their idea, there's this overemphasis on steps of action that appear to be on oversimplification. Now, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that if I take this step and this and this, that, that God's going to bring me through this? Absolutely. So, to them, that's oversimplification. Now, is it can't be that simple. For example, how many people have I talked to, and probably you have, and you talk to them about being saved, and here's what you say. You say, this is how you get saved. This is how God brings about your salvation. You acknowledge that the Word of God is true. You acknowledge that Jesus Christ went to the cross, died on the cross for your sin, paid your sin debt in full, and then you accept Him by faith as your personal Savior on the basis of what He's done. That's the reason He's forgiven you, because He died for you. You ask Him to come into your life and save you, and He does. And how many times people say, well, it can't be that easy. That's too easy. Now, the reason they respond that way is because they want to help God out. 
They want to believe in Jesus, plus they want to do certain things because you know why they want to do certain things? Makes them feel good. Makes them feel like they had a part in it. It can't be so simple that God does it all. And the bottom line is that it's pride. I want to do my share in getting saved. Now, their share is works. But then when you start asking them some questions, they get confused. For example, you say, well, now, uh, you, you want to sort of work? How long are you going to work? And they'll say, well, I guess the rest of my life. Well, that's not going to work. You know, in other words, if it's going to take you the rest of your life to get saved, suppose you die in an accident suddenly. And so the truth is, it's more than, in other words, it is simple in a, in a way. But when you look at the whole complexity, the whole atoning plan of God, it's a complex thing. But my responsibility is simple. Am I willing to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins? Not on the basis that I'm going to do this, that, and the other, but on the basis that he died for me. In other words, all the work was done at Calvary 2,000 years ago. He did all the work. He died in my place. And now I'm to accept him as my personal Savior and to believe in my heart my sins are forgiven. Well, I, I, I'm sure that's, I talked to somebody this week, told me they were saying, well, I, yeah, I hear, I hear you, Pastor, I hear you. Well, the truth is, that's the way it is. But one of the ways that, one of the ways the exhorters misunderstood it, too simple, too simple. And now some steps are not very simple, but they want to say, well, that's just too simple. Then, of course, that is um, urging a person to take these steps and, um, and to follow your leadership and your guidance. Uh, seems to be overconfidence in your steps. Oh, you mean, in other words, you seem to be very confident that if I do this, this will happen. Well, that's true. Well, now, why is the exhorter so confident? Because he's been there or she's been there. They have watched this in other people's lives. They know the principles of Scripture that say, here's what happens, cause and effect, the consequences of these things. And so, therefore, it isn't oversimplification. And not only is it not oversimplification, but it's not a matter that we are overconfident. We just know that when a person takes wise steps in their life, whatever they're facing, they're going to be tremendously, listen, tremendously victorious blessings that come as a result. So the person who balks at the exhorter needs to stop and think, well, how's it worked in their life? Worked in their life. And this is why the exhorter oftentimes is very prone to point out not some individual that you may know, but it could be. And how God has worked in other people's lives because they want you to understand that these are principles and not just something that somebody has said or something that they've read. It's a biblical principle. And the exhorter is going to be quick to validate those principles in the Word of God to say, now this is how God worked in Abraham's life or Joseph's life or David's life or Peter or Paul or whatever. Very, very important that we understand that. Then, of course... The desire uh, to win non-Christians. The desire to win non-Christians by saying, listen, it's the life you live before them. Well, how they misunderstand. Well, you're not very evangelistic. You're just telling me that I can lead somebody to Christ by living a godly life. That's not the only way, but what the exhorter who is interested in growing you up and growing me up, what they're interested in is, listen, our growth and what the exhorter is simply saying is this, as you grow in your Christian life, people are going to see how God is working in your life, and they're going to want the same Christ that you have. When they get in a crisis, they're coming to you, and you have the wonderful privilege of explaining to them how God worked in your life. So it's not a matter of just oversimplification. It isn't a matter of them being unevangelistic. They can be very evangelistic, but that's the exhorter's approach. And so somehow folks, some folks don't get that. They say, well, you know what? You're just, uh, you're not very evangelistic. Then on the other hand, that person uh, may turn around and say, well, you know, I realize that uh, maybe, maybe, your approach is, maybe your approach is right. And, and that is, uh, you, you've got to work on this whole thing of spiritual growth. And so because they do that, uh, they get misunderstood. And then on the other hand, for example, when uh, they desire to win people by a person's life. People don't understand that. And so the truth is, the exhorter is just doing what, what his drive is. For example, an evangelistic person. Let's take, for example, like Billy Graham. And he's, listen, Billy Graham can preach a simple message, give an invitation, the Spirit of God just falls all over the place. Falls all over the place. 
I mean, people come down the aisle. It's not because it's him. It's because God, he has the gift of an evangelist. That's his ministry. And so if I got up and said the same thing he did, probably not much would happen. You know why? Probably not much would happen. Because that's his ministry. That's what God called him to do. God didn't call me to be an evangelist. I'm glad he didn't. He called me to, listen, to teach the truth of the Word of God, to teach it both to believers and to unbelievers. <laughs> now, you can't put one above the other. All the gifts that God gives, they're all equal in God's eyes. He just calls us all to do something different. And so, we wouldn't expect you to do something that God hasn't called you to do. And sometimes, people who do what God's called them to do, they're misunderstood because their motive is right, and some people can do it very wisely, very carefully, very successfully. And when a person is trying to act out of their gift, or it's not their gift, and that it's not, in other words, you say, well, shouldn't everybody win people to Jesus? Well, my answer is yes. The way God uses and works in your life to do it, and it won't be the same in everybody's life. And so, the exhorter, of course, they desire that you and I become godly and walk godly in such a fashion that people would be attracted to Jesus by us. It doesn't mean that they're not evangelistic. It's just their approach is not the same. Then, of course, sometimes they're misunderstood because they'll accuse us of using Scripture for personal application and to say, well, you know what? That's not what it says. Now, watch this carefully. In 1 Corinthians, for example, chapter 10 and uh, verse 11, Listen to what Paul says here, because this is so perfect about what we are talking about. Somebody says, well, you know what? God didn't say that to us. Now, listen carefully. Through the Holy Spirit, God had men pin the truth of what we call the Word of God, which is what it is. Now, they wrote to the people of their day. Now, you say, well, if they wrote to the people of their day, it doesn't apply to us. Yes, it does. Now, listen to Paul. Listen to what he says. He's writing to the Corinthian church. Now, these things happened to them. He just gave a bunch of examples of what had happened to Israel. These things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. Now, listen to Paul. Paul said, God in the Old Testament worked in the lives of the nation of Israel, and the things that are written in the Old Testament were, were listen, were written to them, but written for our instruction. Well, so it is in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. Was it written to us? No. It was written to them, but it was written also for us. So therefore, you and I take scriptures and we apply them because they're principles. Now watch this. If it was some ceremonial act of sacrifice, God isn't expecting us to perform sacrifices. But here's a principle. Forgive, even as your Father has forgiven you through Jesus Christ. That's a principle. I can't change it. It's the principle of God. Well, just because Paul wrote that to the Ephesians, does that mean that I can't apply it to my life? No. He wrote it to them, never even thinking about the possibility of the 21st century. He wrote it to them. But listen, what God had Paul write to the Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and Corinthians and Galatians and all the rest, that was Romans, he also meant for it to be written for us so that a person says, well, you're just taking Scripture out of context. No, we're not. Not taking it out of context. We're taking the principles of the Word of God and applying them to our life. And one of those principles happens to be forgiveness. One of those principles, for example, has to do with prayer. And that is that verse after verse after verse about prayer has to do with faith. You've got to link the two together. Ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find is one of those verses, among many. But, but he says, for example, what things have you desire when you pray? Believe that you have received them and it will be granted to you. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know uh, he's going to hear us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we'll have the petition that we desire of him. It's believing and trusting. Principle after principle after principle. Well, the exhorter knows how absolutely essential it is that you and I apply Scripture. For example, again, the 23rd Psalm. We all quote that. And uh, somebody says, well, that, that wasn't written to us. No, it wasn't. God gave it to David. But oh, how have we, we have applied it to our hearts when we've gone through difficulty and hardship in our life. The person with the gift of exhortation 
sometimes is accused of taking t- uh, Scripture out of context. That's not what they're doing at all. What they're doing is saying, here's a principle of Scripture. And if you will apply this through your life, here's what will happen. But sometimes that misunderstanding is, is evident. Then, of course, there's the um, emphasis on steps of action that may cause that person to feel like, well, I'm just a project. You just, I'm just another one of your projects. No, they just happen to know that steps are essential. And we're not using you as a project, and nor are we giving you steps so that you think that we have to have fast results. It's a misunderstanding of the person who has that gift. And so, when I I think about that, I I think about oftentimes um, people have feelings and uh, they only want to talk to people who have this same kind of feeling they have. That is, the feeling that, um, well, you understand me and, and instead of bringing any correction, they just want you to listen without changing. But that's not the way the exhorter is going to think. The exhorter is going to think this way. You know what? I'm willing for you to hurt, if necessary, to grow you up. Now, sometimes that gets a little sticky. But here's what you have to ask yourself. Do I want their acceptance more than I want to see them grow up? This is what gets parents in trouble. They can't stand the kid's rejection. So what do they do? They agree with things they know are not right. Let them do things they know are not right because they can't stand the rejection of their children. So who suffers the most? The children they grow up doing what? Get in their way. When the parent has got to be willing to suffer rejection, hardship, criticism, you name it, but they owe it to their children to tell the truth. And one thing you'll find in the exhorter, they're going to tell you the truth. And you may even have to hurt, but they're willing to let you hurt if necessary, to help you to grow up. Now, I've said that before, and I said again, because I feel very strongly that that's something that needs to be etched into our thinking. A person who loves you dearly, if they have the gift of exhortation, your feelings, while they understand your feelings are not going to result in them violating a principle so you'll feel good, or telling you something that's not true so you won't reject them. They're not concerned about the feeling. They're concerned about growing us up. And you see, the truth is that's a protection. Now, how does this person act when they're in the spirit, and how do they act when they're in the flesh? Well, all of these uh, gifts have the same reaction. That is, we all act a certain way, whether it's a prophet, servant, teacher, giving, uh, mercy, Uh, administration doesn't make sense what it is. We act a certain way when we're in the spirit. That's when we're the most profitable. That's when we're the most successful in whatever we do. We get in the flesh. Listen to what happens. Well, first of all, the exhorter, when the exhorter is in, is, uh, in the spirit, they are very wise. Wisdom is one of their qualities. Very wise in what they suggest and what they do not suggest. Knowing exactly where you are in your life, very wise. When they're in the flesh, you know what? They just operate on the basis of their natural inclinations. And all of us, listen, all of us have what Paul calls in the King James, carnality, or uh, in other versions, the flesh. And the truth is, it's our naturalness. This is what we came into the world with. This is how you naturally act apart from God. And so what happens with the exhorter, when uh, that person's in the flesh, they're just acting within their naturalness. Then, of course, uh, when they're in the spirit, they have discernment. They have the ability to penetrate into a person's heart and understand and see what's going on. They get in the flesh, they're just judgmental. And uh, being discerning is one thing. Being judgmental is something else. And so the discerning spirit is able to convey what the issues are in a loving way. Judgmental says, you know, you get your act together. The third is this. They operate in faith when they're in the spirit. And otherwise, they're just presumptuous. It isn't a matter of trusting God, they just presume. And so in the flesh, we're not very profitable in the work of the Lord. Then likewise, discretion, being very discreet about what they say, what they don't say, how they go about it. And uh, in the flesh, they're just simple-minded. They say things that uh, they should not say, go about it in ways they should not go about it. Likewise, when a 
gift of exhortation is walking in the Spirit, love is overwhelming to them. They're loving people, loving the person they're talking with, which makes them sensitive to where this other person is. And then, of course, when they're not, when they're not um, loving in their spirit, they can just be as selfish as and indifferent as they can be. Because, you see, that's, that's what Satan does in a person's life. When you get in the flesh, it makes us what? When, I, when you look at these, natural inclination, judgment, presumptuous, single-minded uh, selfishness, and then, of course, they can be very creative on the one hand, in the spirit, in the flesh, under achievement. You know what? When you talk to somebody and the negative is there, you're not going to listen to them and certainly not going to follow their directions. And, of course, enthusiasm. When a person has a gift of exhortation and they're walking in the spirit, they're enthusiastic. You know why? They're watching people grow. They're involved in this person's life. They're encouraging this person. And then when they're not in the spirit, walking in the flesh, they're just apathetic. They don't even care. Now, in every single gift is how you operate in the spirit, how you operate in the flesh. All of us could say at some time that all these, all these fleshly things in every single gift, we could all be guilty of some of that. If we are walking in the spirit, we will not. Now, you think about this. The apostle Paul was an exhorter. He gave himself to exhorting people to live a godly life. Now remember this, the Bible says that he gave you that spiritual gift for one primary reason, not to make you happy, not to make you successful, not to make you accepted, but to give yourself away to someone else. So I want to challenge you to do something. I want to challenge you to ask God. You don't happen to have, you may not have this particular gift, but ask God to make you very, very sensitive to the people you work around people you live around, your friends, maybe the folks you go to school with, make you very sensitive to the people around you. And if there's somebody that he wants you to speak to, that he would give you the discernment to speak to that person, a word of encouragement in some fashion. Now, here's what he'll do. He'll take your word of encouragement to that person. You may think it fell on deaf ears, but God will use that oftentimes, many times, most of the time in some way that will open the door for you to speak to them another word of encouragement. Or it may be that he brings them back to you. And the next thing you know, you have become a vessel through whom God is speaking to a person who's deep into something they should not be in deeply dividing their mind, fragmenting their thinking, going through some trial and some big temptation in their life. And he's using you to do what? To help them understand there's a better way. And it may be that God is using you to prevent them from making a mistake that could destroy their life. You see, too often we are so single-minded and so focused on what we want, when we want it, how we can get it, and that's all that matters, that we miss out on why God gave us these gifts. So whatever gift you have, I challenge you to watch how God will use you in a single person's life if you will pray that prayer. Amen? Amen. 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 Father, how grateful we are that though you've given us all different gifts, you've also given us all wondrous opportunities to be a blessing in somebody's life, to be the roadblock that keeps them from destroying their life, to be that signpost along the way that points them in a better direction, to be that voice above all of the voices that they hear that catches their attention and causes them to stop and think and turn their life over to you. I pray the Spirit of God will grant each person who hears this challenge, the courage to live this week sensitive, open, available, ready. It may be just ready to listen or to speak or simply to love them in some way is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.